All right, friends, I'm back. I'm going to read aloud chapter eight, chapter eight, the computer. And I want you to notice that the date finally changes. It is now July the 6th. Amelia, I have a brilliant idea to share with you. Can we hang out tomorrow? Me, sure. Amelia, awesome. And wait for me before you go through the box. I want to learn everything about the other Edith. I stare at Amelia's words, conflicted. All night long, the box in the attic called to me as if an invisible fishing line connected my fingertips to its cardboard edge. I felt a constant tug and pull. This sense that every time I opened my eyes, I was reaching for her through the dark. Me, you can't come over today. My thumbs hover over the glowing screen. The phone vibrates in my palm. Amelia, sorry, no, busy, pretty, please. Can we do it tomorrow? I sigh. Me, I'll wait for you, but I'm bringing the box down to my room. Don't want us to go back in the attic while my parents are around. They might get suspicious. She sends me two thumb up, two thumbs up emojis. I rise from the living room couch and inch to the doorway of the kitchen. I'm sorry, let me reread that part. I rise from the living room couch and inch past the doorway to the kitchen. Mom knocks an egg against the kitchen counter. Its shell spits into, not spits, splits. <laughs> sorry, guys. Its shell splits in two and the raw yolk drops into the skillet with a slick sounding thwick. Dad pours pale batter over our waffle iron. Bacon is sizzling on the stove top. The coffee pot is gurgling in its corner. Both my parents are focused on their tasks, speaking to each other in hushed voices. I hurry down the hall, rise up on my tiptoes, lower the ladder. It unfolds with a noisy creak, and I wince, but I don't think either of them heard it. Still, need to make this fast. I climb the ladder, pull myself over the ledge, dodge around various piles of junk, scoop the box up in my arms, hurry back. Despite how careful I am, my shoe clicks the edge of the fat computer monitor. It topples over with a clunk screen first. Then, unbelievably, its boxy rear and tips to the side and an and in apparent slow motion, it falls over with even a louder smash. My breath whooshes out of me. My parents must have heard that. For a split second, I'm frozen, unable to move, unable to do anything. Then the air rushes back into my lungs, and I set the box aside to crotch and give the monitor a push, rolling the stupid thing to its original spot. But it's heavier than it looks and I'm struggling with it, clenching my teeth as it clunks in place. Relieved, I stand and step back, reach for the box, freeze. No, no, this isn't right at all. The computer wasn't this far to the left when I first came up here, and the angle was wrong. It was facing the attic's entrance, and now it's twisted around in the wrong direction. This is clear evidence that I was here, that I was up to something. I can't leave it without fixing it. So I fall back into my crotch and push. As I, as I heave the bulky monitor into position, it groans and screeches across the wooden floor. Uncle Phil's voice roars to life in my head, spewing the words he used to avoid cussing in front of me. Should take mushrooms, fiddlesticks. Finally, the computer is settled. I'm still amazed by its size and weight. I can't imagine using this ancient thing, and it's almost impossible to picture it in our office down the hall. The computer we have now is sleek and bright, its keys slender and whispery. This one is its opposite, boxy and bulky with a wide, chunky keyboard. With my heart hammering wildly in my chest, I scoop up the other Edith's box and scrabble down the ladder. Shove the ladder, slamming the overhead door shut, and I bolt for my bedroom. Kick that door shut 
too. Let me see. I'm going to read that again. Kick that door shut too. Fudge. That was too loud. Everything was way too loud. But at last, I have the box now. I take it to my closet and hide it inside my cedar art chest. I grab a pile of blankets and toss them over the closed trunk. Then I sneak out of, then I sneak out of there and tiptoe back to the living room couch. Enjoy the bacon while you can, Mom says as she slides a few more greasy strips onto my plate. I think it might be on the list. We are seated around the table for breakfast. Our plates are filled with golden brown waffles, sunny side up eggs, and clusters of grapes. Mmm, sounds yummy, right? The white cotton curtains are shielding us from the early sunlight. Toast pops up in the toaster. Dad twists the cap of a bottle of orange juice. Can you guys visualize all this? It's awesome, right? Are you ready for tomorrow, Mom asks. I reach across the counter to grab my toast. What's tomorrow? Your appointment with Dr. Ashwood. Ashworth. The toast drops to my plate. Mom leans back to her seat. Dad clears his throat as he pours orange juice into three separate glasses. Did you forget? She asks in her gentlest voice. No, I don't know. I touch my fingertips to my two front teeth, the small gap in between. Dad passes me the fullest glass. Are you nervous about the procedure? Not really. Should I be? It's okay if you are. We know it won't be easy for you. He reaches across the table, brushes my knuckles with his thumb, but it won't last forever. We could go over the list and the schedule again, if you like, so that you'll know what to expect, so that you'll know to expect. I pull my hand away. That's okay. I'm fine. My parents exchange a quick, confused look. Then dad starts slathering his toast in butter while mom takes a long sip of her orange juice. So, he lifts his voice, forcing optimism. How's the short film coming along? It's going. Did Serenity and Amelia like your drawings of the dog? He asks. I shrug. Mostly. Mostly? The orange juice hits the table with a smack. What's that supposed to mean? I shrug a second time. Grab my toes, dip it into the bright yellow yolk. The egg center burst and spills all over my plate. Mmm, that's my favorite, guys. How could they not love the little fellow, Mom croons? He's such a great muse for the film project. You didn't love him either? Her eyes widened with shock. What? The real dog? I remind her. At the reservation, you told me to get away from him. I shove the dripping toast into my mouth. Mom and Dad exchange looks again. This time, their expressions are full of silent alarm. That was different, sweetie, Dad says. That was a real animal, a wild, feral animal. I take my time to chew and swallow. It was only a dog, a sweet little dog. He was gigantic. He was a gigantic dog, Mom argues. He might have hurt you, but he didn't. We don't know where he came from, but we could have, fo but we could have found out. We could have helped him. Mom flinches, looks away from me, lifts her hands to massage her temples. I like doing this. Mm, you see, ever see your parents do this? Mm. There's nothing we could have done, she says. She unleashes a long sigh and adds, I'm sorry. You're wrong, I tell her. You're both wrong. We could have done something. We could have helped him find his way home. Dad says, that's our point, sweetheart. He didn't have a home. Then we could have given him one. I rise from my chair, carry my plate to the sink. Thanks for breakfast, but I'm not that hungry. My parents say nothing as I walk down the hall and shut myself inside my room. All right, guys, that was chapter eight. A lot of visualize, visual, visual, lots of text that actually creates that visual in your brain. So we will be talking about that. Excuse the little mistakes I made along the way, 
but as a good reader, you always go back and reread it to make corrections, okay? Deuces.